Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, feel free to share where you are tuning in from in the chat. We'd love to see where everybody is, is joining us today for this webinar. And yeah, thank you so much for being here. So this is the Concussion Legacy Foundation's webinar off the soccer and football pitch, concussion CTE and caring for a loved one. Um, I'm Julia Manning, Senior Director of Communications and Programs here at CLF. Here we are. Oh, so great to see so many people and love to see where you're joining us from, that's wonderful. Um, again, thank you for being here. Um, this is our first webinar in our CTE Awareness Month webinar series. We have four others that we're planning throughout the month. Um, so be sure to sign up for those. Um, we're gonna be putting a link in the chat now so you can sign up for those webinars. You see the different topics there on your screen. So we hope you'll join us um, throughout the rest of the month. But today we're really honored to have Don Astle and Rachel Walden from the Jeff Astle Foundation and the newly formed Department for Neurodegenerative Diseases at the PFA here to talk about their experiences with CTE as family members and John Messinio from the PFA to talk about how we can improve player health and you know, his perspective um, as a player. So we will be taking a few questions for our panel at the end of the program. So please feel free to submit any that you might have at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or over in the chat. Um, and we'll make sure to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. And a quick note too, we will be sending out the webinar to the email addresses that you registered for. So if you had to step away or leave early, we will be um, sending out a recording later on. We'll also be posting the recordings on our social media pages. So that if you don't already, please make sure to follow us there and connect with us and you can find um, a link to them there. So now um, I would love to introduce our host for this session, Dr. Adam White. Dr. White's the executive director of CLF UK and an interdisciplinary researcher, researcher in sport, exercise, and health and education at Oxford Brookes University. And right now, Dr. White is leading a research program in collaboration with Boston University researchers on the CTE caregiver experience. So Adam, Dr. White, thanks so much for being here. I'll turn it over to you now to give us a brief look into the history of CTE and soccer. Marvelous. Uh, and thank you, Julia. And thank you. It, it, it's a real privilege to be able to host this, this webinar today. Um, so CT is a neurogenitive disease associated with repetitive head impacts, um, such as heading the ball in soccer. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about here today. Here, and, and just as a brief introduction of CTE, here we see a, an accumulation of hyperphosphorylated tau, neurofibrillary tangles, neurites, and sometimes astrocytes surrounding blood vessels. And this is most uh, prominent in the depths of the cortical soci. Uh, CTE presents similar to other dementias and can include a range of behavioral memory and, and memory disturbances. But unlike other dementias, CTE often starts much earlier, even with teenagers being diagnosed with this condition. The first case of CTE in soccer players in the literature was published in 1999 by Geds and colleagues, who reported finding mild changes of CTE in a 23-year-old amateur soccer player who regularly headed the ball while playing and had a history of a single severe head injury. But the player was not named and therefore diagnoses went mostly unnoticed. The first named case of CT in soccer was announced back in 2014 in the United States, where researchers at the VABU CLF Brain Bank diagnosed Pat Patrick Grange with stage two CTE after he died in 2012, age 29, from degenerative motor neuron disease likely related to his ALS. Grange was diagnosed with ALS just one year prior to his death. Grange's parents say he began heading the ball as young as three years old and remember a few significant concussions throughout his high school soccer career. Grange went on to play division one soccer before competing at a semi-professional level. Here on the screen, you can see an image of what Grange's brain looked like under a microscope. This image was published as the sixth figure in Dr. Anne McKee's 2014 paper in Acto, Acta Neuropathologica uh, titled The Neuropathology of Sport. Dr. McKee, director of the VABU CLF Brain Bank, found extensive frontal lobe uh, damage in Granger's brain corresponding to the part of the head that would have been used for headers. But more research needs to be done to draw definitive causation between heading the ball and the development of CTA. We do not know heading the ball poses increased risk for concussions, but, con con but concussion is not directly connected to CTA. Attempting to head the ball and colliding or falling accounts for nearly one third of concussions in youth soccer, 
and the majority of head impacts in the career of field players. Also in 2014, Dr. Leah Grimberg and Dr. Roberta Rodriguez from our Global Brain Bank in Sao Paulo diagnosed Brazilian so soccer star and World Cup champion Hildorado Bellini with stage four CTE. Dr. McKee confirmed the diagnosis of Bellini uh, and Bellini died age 83 from what doctors believe to be Alzheimer's disease. These diagnoses inspired CLF's Safer Soccer Program, which it launched with Santa Clara University's in Institute of Sports Law and Ethics to educate parents, coaches, and soccer stakeholders on the benefits of delaying the introduction of headers in youth soccer until high school. US women's soccer legend, Brandy Chastain and Cindy Parlo, Cone and Joy Fawcett led the campaign, which saw the major victory in November 2015 when US soccer announced a series of safety initiatives, including rules that strictly prohibit players 10 and younger from heading the ball and reduces headers in practice for 11 to 13 year old players. Being from the UK, the issue of concussion, CTE and caring for a loved one is most to be recognized in the story of Jeff Astle. Astle, nicknamed the King, played centre forward for West Bromwich Albion, and he went on to play for England on five occasions. While Astle captivated the hearts of many football fans, even beyond his home club, his notoriety and legacy have continued after his death. Despite Astle passing away in 2002, he was actually studied in 2014 by Dr Willie Stewart and subsequently became the first soccer player to be diagnosed with CT in the UK. Jeff's story lives on today due to the tremendous dedication and damn right tenacity of his family to shine a light on the impact CTE had on Jeff in his early 50s. But Jeff Astle is not alone, and even players at the lower leagues of British football are being diagnosed with CTE following their playing careers. Rod Taylor played professionally for Portsmouth, Gillingham, and Bournemouth and Boscombe Athletic. In 2018, Rod Taylor was also diagnosed with both dementia with Lewy bodies and CTE by Dr. Willie Stewart. And again, it is down, right, down to the work of his family that we can shine a light on the issues of concussion, CTE, and caring for a loved one in soccer today. It's now time for me to bring in to our first two guests. Caring for a loved one with brain injury and CTE can be difficult and isolating. Today, we wanted to bring you two perspectives from the daughters of Jeff Astle and Rod Taylor. Dawn Astor is the daughter of former, uh, former player Jeff Astor. Dawn has spent the last two decades campaigning for football authorities to publicly recognize the link between repetitive headers in football and dementia in later life. Dawn was recently announced as the project lead for the Department for Neurodegenerative Diseases at the Professional Footballers Association in the UK. Rachel Walden, the daughter of Rob Taylor, uh, Rachel is a trustee of the Jeff Astle Foundation and has been appointed alongside Dawn to help her shape the PFA's dementia work. At the PFA, Rachel will oversee the extended family support advisors team. Together, their experience and advocacy has helped bring public awareness to the long-term health risks of sport. Dawn and Rachel, along with the entire Jeff Astle Foundation, have been incredibly supportive of our work at the CLF UK, and it is my pleasure to have them join me today. I can speak personally of their phenomenal work, and I'm humbled and privileged to share this platform with them here today. Their courage and determination to share the stories will help prevent other families from going through similar experiences. So Dawn, Rachel, thank you for joining us. Thank you. That's good. So um, Dawn, for those of us that don't know you so well, um, I think it'd be a great start for you to tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. Um... Hi everybody, it's um, it's a privilege to to be here with you tonight and to talk to you about my dad. Um, probably the most important person in my life growing up. Um, life has to end, but love doesn't. Um, but my dad um, was such a brilliant man he was he was um as well as being an incredible footballer um he was just an incredible human being and i remember not long after he died 
one of his former teammates said, if you ever wanted to know where Jeff was in the room, you always followed the sound of people's laughter. Um, and he was thought of as much as Jeff Astle, the man, um, as much as he was Jeff Astle, the footballer. Um, but as Adam said, um, it was in 1998 when my dad was um, about nearly 55 that our lives and and his life uh, would change forever. Um, as I said, he, he was only 55 when we noticed that he was forgetting things. Um, he couldn't remember my son's name when he was born. Um, and he kept asking if his mother was still alive. You know, my grandmother had died some 16 years before. Um, none of us really understood what was happening to him. Um, and my mum used to literally beg him, beg him to go and see a doctor. But my dad never ever thought there was anything wrong with him <laughs> from the day he was diagnosed till the day he died. Um, I can see him now saying, what do I want to see a doctor for? They're busy. Um, I'm as fit as a fiddle. But we managed to get him there and tests and scans followed and um, they told us that dad's frontal brain cells were dying and basically there was nothing anybody could do. You know, as we know, the brain doesn't regenerate. There's no brain transplant. It's a process that's irreversible. So at the age of uh, 55, he was diagnosed with um, dementia, early onset Alzheimer's disease. And from that day, really, the, the disease took more of a hold as the weeks and months passed. Um, he would try and eat things that weren't edible. He would try and drink anything that was in um, liquid form, uh, whether that be cooking oil or, or vinegar. He was incredibly restless. Um, he would try and get out of a moving car. He became, through one of the stages, I can only really describe it as being completely socially unacceptable. He would scream in the face of strangers and use um, swear words I'd never heard before. Um, he was aggressive at times, afraid to go outside at times. Uh, and then on hot sunny days, sometimes my mum couldn't even open, open a window. But in his final years of his life, um, he would have to wear an adult nappy. Um, drink from a baby beaker because his hands would shake so violently and he just lay on the sofa um you know he was surrounded by everything that he'd won in football uh, england caps fa cup winners medal league cup winners medal but he remembered none of it um he didn't even know he'd ever been a footballer before and i've said it many times everything that football gave him we now know that it's football took away and we lost a little part of him every day and endured the pain and helplessness of, of seeing him taken from us. And it was very frustrating. There was lots of tears, overwhelming sadness as we all lived seeing pieces of him stripped away really daily until all that remained was a, a physical shell. Um, as I said, he couldn't speak or do the most basic of everyday things for himself. But as a family, you know, we we sort of held his hand and, and, and guided him through his daily life and through all the futility, I guess, and despair and pain and sadness, there were the odd glimpses of joy, um, a flicker, just that brief flicker that passed his eyes that you thought was a split second of recognition of you. Um, and that carried you through, but broke your heart in equal measure. And he died four and a half years later, um, January the 19th, 2002, um, a day that continues to haunt me um, every single day. Um, he he choked to death um, on his own sick um, in front of me, um, my mum, my sisters, his grandchildren. Um, and it was, it was just horrific. Um, 
But then we attended um, 10 months later, uh, a coroner's court um, at Burton on Trent. We didn't know there was going to be one. We, um, we didn't ask for one. Um, and that's when a pathologist stood and described how badly damaged my dad's brain was. Um, he found that there was considerable evidence of trauma right through the brain and that it looked like the brain of a boxer. And he said that the main candidate for this trauma was the repeated heading, heading of heavy balls during his career. Uh, repeated being the key word. And Her Majesty's coroner, Andrew Haig, actually said Mr. Astor's type of dementia is entirely consistent with heading footballs and his occupational exposure had made at least a significant contribution to the disease that had killed him. And the verdict um, was industrial disease. In other words, dad's job had killed him. Um, and it was a landmark ruling, um, you know, you know, we were, we were devastated, you know, the, the job that my dad did and mastered and had, had no doubt inspired so many had ultimately killed him. But we were heartened by the news that the footballing authorities appeared to be taking this seriously as, uh, as potential risks of heading footballs when they announced that they were actually conducting a 10 year study looking into the links between heading footballs and, and degenerative brain disease. But it was in March 2014 that we, um, we found out from a reporter that this, um, this research was never really concluded and it collapsed after five years. And I guess we assumed naively um, and incorrectly that the inquest ruling by the coroner of industrial disease um, would be a real defining moment and the sport would react with vigour to both protect future generations of footballers and help those past heroes who were dying and whose families, many of which are often facing collapse. And we also assumed incorrectly that the research started in 2001, which was funded by the Football Association and the Professional Footballers Association, the union, would address the two most obvious questions. Um, how many former players have got dementia? And is the game safe now? And it did neither. All it did was track 30 odd youngsters in the game. And as I say, most of them dropped out of the professional game and, uh, and a lot hadn't been followed up. So nothing had been published. No one had the courtesy to even tell my family. Um, but more importantly, this was 12 years after my dad died and we were no further forward. So we, we started a campaign, Justice for Jeff, and we, we dragged, I guess, a a 30 foot banner to all the uh, Premier League games. Um, and we started to gather a bit of momentum. You know, first it was on local radio, local newspapers, and then we started to get uh, more coverage. Um, and we were really angry. Um, my dad, as I said, played at the highest level, um, represented his country in a World Cup, and he deserved better than that from football and it got us thinking as well that if they were going to treat my dad like that how would somebody whose dad played in the lower leagues get on how would they um, get the help that they needed and we thought that the the increased finding would have this earthquake like repercussion for the game um, but not football you know, football and its privileged status of self-governing has wriggled itself out of such situations and, and why should it? And, and a lot of my anger was actually towards the players' union. You know, um, surely this was the kind of issue that weren't their very existence. Um, and I lost all faith in, um, in the PFA's ability to protect its members. You know, my dad died. There could have been thousands of others out there like him but without the studies and without the research, you would never know. But I didn't think they feel that that the you know the union whose entire existence is about player welfare, for me, had completely failed in their duty to try and find try and find out why. Um, and then fast forward another couple of years, and that's when I heard about CTE. Um, I had a I had a conversation with Dr. Willie Stewart. Um, 
Uh, it was a really easy process. I, we just sent an email to him asking him to, to uh, re-examine my dad's brain, which, which was still at Nottingham at the time. Um, and sent an email to Nottingham asking them to send whatever it was. I didn't know. I didn't even know they could still look at the brain, to be honest with you. I, I, I was completely ignorant about the whole thing. Um, I didn't even know whether it, it would have disintegrated in all these years. Um, but we gave them authority to, to, to I said, we examine my dad's brain. Um, and I remember my mum saying to me, there's two things my mum said to me that I, I really remember. The first was straight after the verdict when she said, Dawn, your dad can't possibly be the only one. He can't possibly be. And the second was, uh, if your dad hasn't got CTE, ooh, my dad was renowned head of the ball. People still today still come up to me from all different supporters from all different clubs and saying, you know, your dad was the finest head of the ball that they'd ever seen and scored more goals with his head than his feet. Um, and mum said, Dawn, if your dad hasn't got CTE, no one will. And so it came as no surprise to us when we found out that he didn't have Alzheimer's disease. And as Adam rightly said, my dad then became the first British footballer to, um, to have died of, of, um, of CTE. Um, yeah, so that's when we started sort of harassing barracking, doing everything we could. And I make no apologies for doing everything we could um, because this was really important. As I said, my dad was dead. Um, we knew that there could be thousands of others out there like him. And basically football was, we felt, nowhere near, doing nowhere near enough. And these players deserve a lot more from that, a lot more from them. Absolutely. And, and thank you, Dawn. Um, for sharing that really emotional and, and heartfelt story. Um, one, of the, one of the things you mentioned that, that I think is important is, is what about the players in the lower leagues? And, and, and we're really, really pleased to have Rachel here with us today. Um, Rachel, like Dawn, would, we would love to hear what brought you to this issue as well. Thanks, Adam. And it's very nice to be here this evening. Um, so I, I never heard of CTE. Who does? I mean, um, in, in 2010, my mum got seriously ill with uh, cancer, uh, stage four cancer, and we ended up in London at the Royal Marsden, and she had to have a radical cystectomy, which is the removal of the bladder. And what should have been a two-week period in the hospital turned out to be six or seven weeks. Um, and my brother and I would take it in turns to be up there with my dad to support mum and try and get the bow through it. We were going to the intensive care unit every day to see mum, and on one occasion I walked into the hospital with my dad, and dad being an ex-footballer had horrible knees, horrible hips, and he took the lift and I took the stairs. And I ran down to the basement where the intensive care unit was, and I waited half an hour whilst my dad rode the lift up and down, not knowing which floor to get out, where, where he was going. And when the doors finally opened on the basement, he looked absolutely petrified. And I looked at him and I thought, you know, this, this, this is not right. He was 64 um, at the time. Um, but if I think back now, I can now recognize it, symptoms even earlier than that. So, we got them back both home and from about from from the moment of getting mum and dad home their lives started to unravel dad's mental health deteriorated he became very very anxious um you couldn't calm him he would become obsessive when mum would be sleeping at night my dad would remove the duvet and start measuring the bed because he was absolutely convinced the duvet wasn't the right size for the bed so she became exhausted. Um, and I know Dawn, I've said to Dawn about this many times. We we actually thought, who's going to die first? Is it mum or dad? I mean, it was it was almost like, you know, we, we couldn't believe what was going on. It was an absolute car crash. But we struggled on uh, 2010. Um, mum didn't want to get dad diagnosed. She didn't need to stick a label on him. She knew what it was. It was dementia, but she didn't want to stick a label on him. 
Um, and like all mums, and I know there's a few mums on here tonight who will probably be doing exactly the same, they filter what they tell their kids, even if the kids are adults, because they don't want to worry the kids, they don't want to upset the kids, um, they want the kids to have their own lives. But the kids know what's going on, or to a certain degree they know what's going on, and we only had to walk into the house to see mum absolutely exhausted and, and dad literally comatose in a chair covered in a blanket to know that this was seriously going wrong um so we eventually in 2015 2016 um i reached out to dawn at the foundation and that's when she started to tell me about cte and, and of course i knew the, the name jeff astle um, and then I, ironically my dad had attended one of the one of the very very early functions held um, after Jeff's death um, and my dad completely unaware that he was going to go down the same path. Um, so there I am talking to Dawn and you know all my concerns about my mum and dad and, and what I could do to support them and I started contacting the PFA and they arranged to have dad go to a respite centre once a week where he would enjoy a hydrotherapy bath. He was a typical footballer, he liked a deep hot bath um and we were able to get mum off to the cafe or the garden center to to give her a bit of um you know r and r but it soon it soon turned to the point where we knew that dad shouldn't be at home um mum absolutely resisted she wasn't going to put him in anywhere um but she did finally agree in about 2017 to stick that label on him and the label that the consultant neurologist gave my dad was Alzheimer's disease and gave him a medication and assigned a dementia specialist nurse. Um, and that was basically it. Um, the medication caused more problems and the, 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 the behaviour became even more difficult to handle. He became doubly incontinent. Um, it was just dreadful food, food obsessions, um, thinking that people were in the house, thinking that the floor was moving, falling. Um, and in 2018, we, to, to my, I will, I will carry this for forever. My brother and I pleaded with my mum to put dad into a respite facility just so she could sleep. And he went into a respite facility and four or five days later of having been in there he'd already tried to escape a couple of times um we arrived to see an ambulance outside and I turned to my mum because I take my mum in the car I hope that's not dad and we walked in and it was dad and he was on the floor and the ambulance were giving him gas and air and I knelt down beside him and held his hand and I said it's rage and he didn't really know who I was um and he'd broken his hip. And we we waited for the ambulance to get him into the ambulance and they took him to the local general hospital where he was admitted. Um, I remember sitting outside the cubicle with my mum, my mum was in there with him and my brother was there and my husband was there. And I just, I just knew, I just knew, you know, oh, it, it's it's well documented that all, uh, elderly people they don't they don't do well after a hip fracture. Um, I think there's some stats out there, and there's my dad with advanced dementia, um, and he's got a hip fracture. Um, he's also got heart failure, um, and I just knew it was it. I, I I knew that it was time to to lose him, but I I was ready to lose him, and that sounds awful because he was the world to me, but his illness and his decline was so awful that he would ask my brother to smother him with a pillow on a regular basis he couldn't actually articulate it he couldn't say the words but he would say to my brother he'd pick a pillow up and put it to his face and he would plead with my brother to to end his suffering so when when that suffering actually was drawing to an end at poor hospital I felt relief and I just wanted him to go and 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 go he did he went in April 2018 um and my mum was with him I wasn't with him um my brother was there and um and that was it and the one of the first people I called was Dawn um 
she's my best mate and um and I knew we'd had the conversation that when dad was no longer with us that we wanted to do the brain donation as a family we'd already had that conversation we desperately wanted to know what had happened because the dementia nurses didn't know what was happening they they kept saying to us we don't recognize this this is just unusual and the medication wasn't working and we were just desperate to know and we knew the only way of finding out what had happened to dad was to do the brain donation so Dawn got on the phone, which enabled me and my mum and my brother to organise dad's funeral. And um, I think it was about two, three days after dad passed away, dad's brain was sent to Dr. Stewart in Glasgow. And we carried on with the funeral preparations, had the funeral, and then we waited a couple of months in between. We spoke to Willie, he took our testimony. Um, and then finally, I think it was the July time, uh, Willie came through to mum and confirmed that dad had dementia with Lewy bodies and CTE, um, grade three, stage three. Um, and it just explained so much. The medication that my dad was being prescribed for his Alzheimer's disease was actually contraindicated for the dementia with Lewy bodies. So the actual medication that he was being prescribed was causing more problems. It was, it was harming him even more. And that makes me kind of angry. And that's why I'm so passionate now when I talk to families that they, you know, it, it, it seems to be such a difficult thing to get a real diagnosis of what exactly this dementia is. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why they can't nail it down. Um, but every day uh, through the work that we do at the, the PFA union, we talk to families that are going through exactly this every day. And it, and it breaks my heart. Um, and I don't know what the answer is to that. I don't know why it's so difficult to get that diagnosis right so that you're not hurt, you're not harming that individual. But there we are. So, yeah. So in 2021, Dawn and I started to work together. Um, I'd already become a, a tr trustee at the foundation and then we, we, we joined the PFA to scope a new department and that's that's we've just sort of come to the end of that 14 month period great and and, and thank you rachel these um we'll, we'll definitely be talking more about the pfa department uh, as we move through and we're, we're pleased to have john here the, i think i've heard both of you talk many occasions in the past and and these stories never get any easier for us to to hear and people to hear so so thank you for sharing that um rachel just just before we move on really traumatic experiences and, and caring for someone with CTE can be really difficult. Tell us the impact this has had on you. Um, I'm just about to tell a, a, a screen full of people that I don't really know apart from the guys on the panels that um, I was diagnosed with clinical depression in 2015 because I was basically watching the disintegration of my family. I, I became very, very seriously ill. I was signed off work in a job that I'd been in many, many years. Um, and I, I couldn't function. I couldn't function because you are literally watching your, your whole life disintegrate and you are powerless. Um, and it was incredibly hard. And I think in all fairness, I'm just about coming out the other end now. And that's the year that's coming up for four years since my dad's death. And very, very sadly, I lost my mum last Christmas, just over a year ago, to motor neuron disease. Um, and, and unbeknown to us, my mum actually started to suffer with the symptoms of motor neuron disease in the last year of my dad's life. And I know that CTE finished my mum off far, much quicker than she should, she should still be here. But, you know, this, 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 the family crisis that's involved around CTE is just horrendous. Nothing can, you, you can't even get your head around how bad it can be for families and people. Um, and every day I talk to people in that exact position um, and I, I say to them, you know, look after yourself, try, try and do something about you. But when, you're, when, a, when a wife or has been up awake all night whilst her husband is literally walking around the home in a very very agitated state um and and you they're not able to sleep that that you know you can understand why you've got carer crisis and the 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 sad thing is is that the wife feels guilty 
or the main carer feels guilty because they they just can't see a way out of it. And they're they're actually putting their lives on on the line, um, and they're willing to to you know do whatever they have to do to keep that individual at home. And my mum was exactly the same. My, she didn't want my dad going anywhere. Um, so the impact's huge. It's it's absolutely huge. And, and and Dawn and I both talk to daughters and sons and wives and 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 carers who are absolute. You know, they'll say, "I'm I'm going to the doctors. I'm on antidepressants. I'm I'm, I'm having counselling." It's um it's hard. It's really hard. No, absolutely. And, and thank you, Rachel. Um, I know that Brandon's put put the link in the chat already, but but for those that are looking for for some resources and some support in this. Please do click the link. Um, we have some some useful bits at the CLF that, that can help. So thank you, um, Dawn. I I know you spoke a lot about why you why you donated your brain and, and trying to find answers. What what would you say to other people that are considering pledging their brain for for research or or a loved one's just recently passed and they're considering donating? What what advice would you give? Um. Well, all this really, um, you know. It, where, we, where we've got to now um, isn't because of me, isn't because of my family, isn't because of the Jeff Astor Foundation. All this um, is because of my dad. And he didn't have a lot of opinions, my dad didn't. He wasn't interested in anything other than football, horse racing and cricket, to be quite honest with you. He couldn't have told you the Prime Minister was because he just wasn't interested in it. Um, but one thing that I remember he he was quite passionate about was uh, organ donation. And I can see him now sitting in the chair and an advert would come on the television and he would say and turn to, to us and say, why wouldn't you want to donate a part of your body to help somebody live when, you, when you're dead and gone? Um, and brain donation is probably the most valuable gift of all uh, for future generations of footballers um, and by donating the brain we we're adding another piece um, to this jigsaw which will help us build and and complete the picture of how the brain works both where there are signs of disease but also where there are not um, and it may be many, many years before this jigsaw is complete, but by adding each piece one at a time um, is the only way we'll get a better understanding of the true picture and so be able to make a, a better future for, for others. Um, as I said, my dad didn't have big opinions, um, but donating was something that he really believed in and he cared passionately about. And my mum remembered that. Um, and we all remembered that. So when she was asked about donating um, Dad's brain after he passed away, you know, my mum had no hesitation whatsoever. Um, little did we know that all these years ago, how much his brain would reveal. Um, I say all the time, his, his brain is now speaking for the living. His brain has given us the gift of knowing. Um, and because of that, hopefully today's generation and future generations of footballers will be safer. And, you know, I'll say it again, and that wasn't down to me or my family or the foundation, but that's because of my dad and, uh, and that will be his legacy for, for always. Um, going back to what um, Rachel was talking about, um, I think it's really important um, that people understand, really understand um, the effect um, of, of watching somebody struggle through their life with CTE and die of CTE. Um, there's no set timetable for grief, is there, obviously, and some people can start to feel better after a couple of months or you read things and it said the whole process could take up to four years. Um, you can start to feel better in in small ways. Um, it's a little easier to get up in the morning. Um, you've got a little more energy and you can concentrate a little bit more. But that fog of grief um, is emotional and 
um, mental and physical. And it takes its time to unravel and release. And I'm not ashamed that 20 years uh, after my dad died, uh, every Tuesday for two years of my life, I went to a, a, a mental health facility. To this day, I still take tablets at night time. Um, because my brain was so overloaded um, with thoughts of grief and sadness. It, it affected my memory, even my concentration, my cognition, because it was so focused on the grief of losing my dad and seeing what he went through. There was, it was like there was no room or very little room for everyday tasks. And I, and I really mean that. It was like, for me, it was more like, a, a, they described it as a, like a, um, a, a PTSD because I was reliving him choking to death in front of us. And at times I, I literally thought I was losing my mind. I did. Um, I w it was very disorientating for me as well. Um, everything. Everything had changed um, because I couldn't focus on anything other than my dad's death. And like Rachel said, there was guilt, um, anger, this, this immense longing and sadness and, and regret. And to be very honest, you know, the, the guilt was because I'd, I'd done this tea that he choked to death eating. So the guilt was, if I hadn't done it, he'd, he would have still been alive or perhaps he would have lived a bit longer. Um, the regret of not going to see him as much as I should have done. But I couldn't do it. It, it literally ripped my heart out. And those things, as difficult as it's been on this, this crazy journey, um, that's what keeps you going. Because at times I feel sorry for my bloody self, and I do. And, I, and at times I wish it would all go away. But I just have to think about my dad and that he loved his life, he loved his family. He loved watching his football club and he lost all that, all that far too soon. And it, and it drives you on, you know, you have a, you feel sorry for yourself for a bit, but then you, you give yourself a kick up the backside and, and you carry on again. Um, but to anybody who's living with, whether you're son, daughter, wife, brother, mum, dad, you know, please look after yourself. You must look after yourself. I can't emphasise that enough. And, don't be embarrassed or ashamed, you know, because it's it's huge. It is huge. And I said it completely, completely took over my life and continues to do. And continues to do. I'm just learning now to live with it a bit better than I did before, but it, it never goes away. Yeah. Dawn, Dawn and Rachel, thank you so much and, and and thank you for sharing such personal stories which which I know will resonate with lots of people listening today and, and that we'll get to listen to this back back in the future so thank you so much um, you will be hanging around for some Q&A so please if anybody's got any questions pop them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll come back to them shortly but thank you ever so much so before we move on to our next guest um, I want to discuss an ongoing study at Boston University called Shine um, most of what we currently know about the long-term effects of repetitive head impacts is based on research conducted on male tackle American football players or, or male athletes. Um, and Shine is the first study on professional female soccer players. Uh, the CLF is leading the recruiting efforts for the study alongside the US women's national team icons, uh, Michelle Akers and Brandy uh, Chastain. Shine provides an opportunity to begin our understanding of the effects of repetitive head impacts in females. And this is research that, that is much needed. Um, and the CLF is really proud to have pledged $100,000 to the study already. And so if you'd like to support that study, you can make a contribution in, uh, at the link in the chat that's just about to be posted. 
Uh, we're grateful for the support of the US women's national team players that are part of the study. Uh, and in the UK, we want to recognize the support of our players, which is why I'm thrilled to introduce our next guest, uh, John Massinho. John is the Oxford United Club captain and chair of the Professional Footballers Association's Players Board. Uh, John pledged to donate his brain as part of the Concussion Legacy Project launch uh, that we announced in September of 2021. Uh, John began his playing career at Brentford and was signed to Oxford United in August 2017. Uh, and John was elected the chair of the Professional Footballers Association's Players Board and has been a key agent of change at the PFA over the last couple of years particularly on the issue of concussion and CTA. So thank you, John, for joining us. We're, we're really pleased that you're, you're able to be here today. Uh, and so thank you. Cheers, Adam. So John, um, as a current player, tell us why you take the issue of concussion and CTE so seriously. Well, I think that it's, uh, it's an issue that's obviously been bubbling in the background for, for a number of years, uh, mainly through the um, sort of work of of campaigners like Dawn um, and Rachel and and I think others who were on this call, uh, but unfortunately that campaign, like I said, was was bubbling away in the background and wasn't really in the forefront of any current footballers' minds and certainly not in the minds of football authorities. Um, and I think you've heard you know some some pretty um, scathing views from Dawn there, which as an organisation, as we currently stand, we're not trying to hide behind any of that. We're not trying to live in denial in terms of um, whether we were right or wrong in the past, but essentially the whole the whole issue really came to a head for me about 18 months ago and and it did start with um a discussion with with rachel dawn and, and a couple of the other um stakeholders and campaigners in and around concussion and cte um and other neurodegenerative diseases and it really sort of um hit home that there were there were real you know two issues first of all um you know what are we doing as a union in terms of looking after our former players who are suffering and how can we better deal with the current situation in football, which very you know still very much exists um, through the professional game, through the amateur game, and you know absolutely everywhere in between? Because I think one of the one of the myths that um, unfortunately football has hid behind for a few years is that, that we've got a lighter ball now. It wasn't the the ball that Rach, uh, that Dawn referred to back in the day in terms of being that heavy ball. Um, yes, the ball's lighter. Yes, the game's changed. The technology is different. It means there's a whole host of other problems. I think the the velocity that the ball travels with is um, is much changed. I think if you go to any modern football match, and certainly down in the lower leagues, you get these goalkeepers that pick the ball up and they can launch it about 80 yards in the air and 80 yards towards the opposition goal. And unfortunately, the centre half on the other end has to deal with that. Um, you know, the speed with which crosses come in, the speed with which longer balls are now played in the game, all of these things make it a relevant problem for, for the modern game as well. So there's, there's two distinct um, issues to talk about in terms of generations. Um, and then there's also distinct issues within, uh, within sort of concussion versus CT itself. So how we deal with those concussions, which we traditionally would say, OK, that's a concussion. We're, we're getting better at that. I think in terms of dealing with it, but we're still, I think, living slightly in denial in football where we go, well, somebody's only concussed if they're laid flat out on the floor with their arms out and you can tell them they're knocked out. And there's just a lack of understanding around what actually, um, you know, what actually constitutes a concussion and then how we should deal with that. Mm -hmm. and, and so my, my involvement has become, um, you know, increased over the past 18 months. Thankfully, we took Dawn and Rachel on at the beginning of 2021. Um, to sort of see where we could go and, and I think like Rachel said scope out this PFA department and scope out this dementia department see where we could go with it and first of all see if Dawn and Rachel um, you know liked what they heard from the PFA because I think if at any time they'd have thought that we weren't taking this issue seriously um, they'd have either told us or walked away so it's really pleasing for me now that we have this um, increased dementia department properly scoped and a strategy properly thought out and I think we're making huge strides I still think we've got a huge amount to catch up on and we've got a long, long way to go. But as it stands now, I think we're in very good hands. You know, as you've heard today, um, harrowing stories. But when I speak to Dawn and when I speak to, to Rachel, of course, they want to offer the support as much as they can to any families that are the suffering with these sort of issues now. But also one of the things that's very, very important to both of them is the fact that if they can prevent this happening in the future, if they can educate, if they can save you know however many lives it is from the current generation then 
then I think all of their work and the two harrowing deaths that we've we've seen, it's not all in vain. Um, and I think that that's a really important message is that, yes, there's there's a huge amount of work to be done there, but but actually let's get serious about the, the current game and its current state and what we can do with, with current players. Um, and a big part of that I know is, is about education and about getting footballers to at least, you know, try and start to understand some of the issues that they're facing. Great. And, and what can we do then, John, to, to support and help players to understand the risks of concussion and CTA? I mean, it's a really good question, Adam, and it's a really difficult one for me to answer because I currently operate in a football dressing room that uh, doesn't pay a huge amount of attention to this issue. When the guidelines were introduced, um, when the heading guidelines were introduced recently, there, there's a bit more talk around what it means to actually head a ball. There's a bit more talk around what CT actually means and what that sort of repetitive subtrauma means as opposed to the concussion that we're talking about. So there is more conversation about it, but I think the whole project is still very much in its infancy because you have essentially in a changing room 25, this is in the men's game that I know about, 25 young men who've got an aura of invincibility and a certain part of their makeup that's got them to the top level of their sport means that they just, you know, completely, um, they, they manage to co completely ignore risk. And they've managed to do that to their benefit. But unfortunately now you do speak to players and I'm guilty of this myself. You speak to players and with all of the evidence that I've seen, and everything that I've um, been involved with over the past 18 months, it still doesn't register with me that the risk is, is there. I know it, but it doesn't necessarily stop me from going and heading balls in training or in games. And that's a question I've directly been asked, and I'd only ever want to answer it honestly. And I think that's part of the makeup of, um, of athletes, professional athletes, is that unfortunately our stance now or our responsibility is that we just sort of have to protect them from, our, from themselves. So education is massive. If we can try and re-deliver the message away from traditional sort of media outlets and what they read in the papers and, and what they see bubbling away in the background, if we get that into the forefront of players' minds, I think that's a really important first step. Um, whether that works or not, I don't know. My suspicion is when you speak to players about the dangers of um, concussion or the dangers of CTE and what could happen to them further down in their career, I think they go, that's something that won't happen to me and I'm going to take the risk unfortunately right and we've got to face that fact as a union and, and face that fact as, as, as charities etc um so we do have to try and re-deliver the message education i think is really important and then we have to try and strip back and go well is the game going to fundamentally change probably not in terms of the amount of heading and the, the type of you know velocity that the ball's traveling at on a, on a Saturday or a Tuesday evening. But I think what we really can change and we really can affect is the everyday training and the everyday practices of these players, the everyday beh behaviours of coaches and clubs. And I think that's probably the most important thing for us, coupled with education and coupled with getting players to realise what the risks are and, and what some of the, you know, the mitigations that they can use in their everyday practices. Um, I think if we can do that, we'll be in a much better place. Unfortunately, that's just in its infancy. I think like, like we heard from Dawn, whilst this is an issue that's been around for um, 20 years uh, and, uh, you know, 20 years in terms of the, the public knowledge, football hasn't done anything about it. And it's only been in the last year, I think, that football as a whole has really taken notice and stood up and started to, um, you know, make changes. Uh, that's just something that's in its infancy and it's, um, it's something we really need to accelerate. Absolutely, and, and we couldn't agree more. And, and I think it's been welcome news this week that the, the PFA has announced some further investment in supporting players and their families with the challenges of concussion, CTE, neurodegenerative disease. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the, the department and, and what the way forward is for, for the PFA? Yeah, so uh, the, the department, I think, um, which we initially had, like, like Dawn and I think Rachel was, was talking about, we, we initially scoped out um, at the beginning of uh, 2021. And um, took Dawn and Rachel on just to see sort of how, how this would go with, um, I think the, the title was, um, was consultant. Uh, and I think the, the, flood of, the flood of calls and the influx of calls from families that were suffering and might just need a 20 minute chat or might need full level of support. And then how valuable it was to actually have Dawn and Rachel who had that lived experience of it 
And, and that was a real difference for us. And that was a, a real you know, sort of turning point for us where all of a sudden we weren't having somebody pick up the phone and try and direct somebody to another organization or say, yes, this is the sort of level of funding we can give you. And then a very sort of cold conversation, I think at that point. And all of a sudden we had that lived experience that you've heard on this call. And a lot of people just uh, from, from speaking to Dawn and Rachel just really, really appreciated the fact that they could speak to someone who knew exactly what they were dealing with. And they knew that, unfortunately, in terms of these types of diseases, it's one that a lot of the time or, or players are oblivious to, right? And, and the sufferer is oblivious to, never actually knows. And it's the families that suffer. It's the, the carers that really have to, um, you know, take the brunt of this. So that's the, the sort of um, history of why we thought this was going to be so successful. Um, and essentially, we've, we've now scoped out what that's going to mean for, for the organisation, um, continuing with with Dawn and Rachel, but again, I think just flooded with too many calls and their expertise need to be um, filtered elsewhere. So bringing on sort of family support advisors and, and training them up. So we're going to bring uh, two family support advisors in, um, a head of department with clinical background. Um, Rachel is the family support consultant and uh, Dawn as the uh, project lead. And in terms of the project lead, Dawn will be dealing with things like um, player education, stakeholder engagement, internal management, etc. Um, and then we've got welfare support that already exists within the organization, admin which already exists, and I think um, information and training support, which we're going to bring in as well. So from where we were 15 months ago, where we had one PFA administrator picking up the phone and, and trying quite hard, I think we're now moving into something that's that's pretty groundbreaking and hopefully we're going to make some real progress with it. Absolutely, and, and thank you. John, back in back in September, we had the privilege of, of meeting you in person and, and you were one of the first people, you were the first professional player in the UK to pledge your brain to the Concussion Legacy Project. What made you do that? And, and what would you say to current players also considering pledging their brains for research in the future? Well, we were, we were, in, a, uh, we were in a strategy meeting or we were in a meeting with, with Dawn and Rachel, myself and the CEO, Mehta Malango. And uh, the question sort of came up talking about the work that we were going to do or they were going to do with CLF in the coming weeks and, you know, raise the question of whether we would donate our brains. And um, for me, it was something that was, uh, you know, definitely in terms of organ donation, I was um, very similar to, to Jeff Astle and always have been um, and thought, yeah, what a fantastic idea. Um, hopefully it's not for a while, but, you know, that that might have, if, if we can have more and more and more players that are willing to do this, then we can properly look into the, um, you know, we can properly look into CTE and we can look at a player's brain. For example, mine I've played for 17 years so far. I've been a centre half for the majority of those. And I think headed a fair few balls, not thankfully had too many concussions that I know of, but I've headed thousands and thousands and thousands of balls. So um, if we can start making those, uh, making those links and just to understand at CT even more of course as we know professional soccer players over in the UK me being the first we need a lot more we need to um, start building up that brain bank and, and speaking to Chris and yourself about it um, it was just a project that I was really willing to to get into and and the CEO Maheta as well and hopefully having done that there's a few others that actually want to do the same. Great and, and John thank you so much for joining us tonight um, we really appreciate your support we're excited to continue working with you on this important issue and, and thank you for joining us and, and sharing your views. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly support the, the direction the PFA's work going in and, and we're really pleased that, that over the last couple of years you've been a real driving force behind that, so, so thank you. We're, we're going to welcome back Dawn and Rachel for a short Q&A as well and, and John, if you're happy to stay and, and answer a couple of questions, that would be great. I know that many people have already put some in the Q&A box for, for us and and I, can, I know that some of them have been answered by the team in the background. Um, but please, please, if you've got any questions for, for John, Dawn or Rachel, please pop them in the Q&A chat and we'll, we'll do as many as we can in the next sort of 10 to 15 minutes, uh, if possible. Um, so the first question um, for, for John really is, do you believe that true temporary concussion substitutions would hurt the game? Or would they be abused in any way, um, like the proponents of the status quo argue? The one argument that we we get the PFA stance at the moment is that we were we we're lobbying for temporary concussion substitutions to come into the game. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as us lobbying and it happening tomorrow. But I think the the one argument that we get back is well, 
We know that football's quite a cynical sport. We know what managers, we know what um, the coaches are like, and they're going to rebu- abuse this. They might do, right? And there's very little we can do about that. But we're never going to know until we actually try it. And I think um, at the risk of a couple of managers, and I don't think this would actually be widespread, at the risk of a couple of managers abusing what would be a rule change, I think it's well worth having or at least trialling temporary concussion substitutions and seeing how they work. Because one thing we know is the pressure cauldron of a game with the fans, with managers, everything that goes with it and the amount of um, the amount that's, that's riding on these games week in, week out, day in, day out, means that unfortunately people make decisions which aren't in the best interests of players. And there's also the, the people that are making the decisions in two, three minutes. It's just not enough time. And we've seen that even recently with, um, I think, Sergio Mane, who had the um, passed the concussion protocols on the pitch, scored and then came off because it clearly wasn't right. And these stories are just rife in the game. We're having them far too much. And we're lucky at this point whereby we hear the stories in the press and it's always the player is actually substituted off without having that second, which could be fatal um, blow to the head in between. So I think in the interest of protecting against that, can we at least have a trial period where we take players out of that intense environment. We take the decision away from the manager who's putting pressure on the physio. And we also take the decision away from the player because players, a lot of the time, they want to bounce straight back up. They want the bandage around the head and they want to get straight back out there. And again, it's just protecting them from themselves. You're not costing the team. We've not gone down to 10 men. There's nothing to worry about. You can come back on. So you don't have to come. You don't have to definitely come off. Just give ourselves a bit more time. Let's see if it works, works or not. If it doesn't work, we can we can look at something else. But I think it's a, a risk that's well worth taking. Sure, great, great. Thanks, John. Um, one one for Dawn and Rachel, really, and, and, and perhaps a difficult one. How, how do we, you know, and, and I think we've all, everybody on the call so far is, is is mentioned that previously the PFA perhaps hasn't been as good as they could have been. And and really how how are we supposed to have faith in the PFA moving forwards? You know, what would you say to those that that are concerned about previous histories of the PFA and 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 hopefully what they're doing in the in the future? Um, yeah, <laughs> um, there was there was nobody more surprised than me when um, when I had the phone call. Um, I think it was November, December time, 20, God, I've lost track of years, 2019. Um, as I said before, I've probably been the PFA's biggest critic. Um, but they reached out to um, for me to try and help them improve the services that they provide to their members. Um, you know, help families through this really difficult journey. Um, showing the PFA uh, what these families need um, and they're really as the union they're uniquely placed I guess as as the players union to make a a real difference to the families who are living with dementia Um, and I said at the time I'd be challenging them, challenging them, you know, every single day to use their voice and influence a lot more strongly now um, within the game, um, and to take the lead, which they should be doing on this on this really important issue on behalf of their members um, moving forward. Um, you know, it's Rachel and I. We both said, you know, we won't be silenced if we believe that they uh, can be doing more. Um, and it was important to put a proper structure in place, which is which is what's happened now. But that doesn't mean the the hard work is um, is over. Far from it. Um, it's not sort of job done. This is where the hard work really starts. And we'll. And even though I've been a, a massive critic of the PFA, you know, um, I actually don't think the whole responsibility should be down to the just the PFA. You know. We want to make sure that all the stakeholders in the game are, are made accountable, you know, um, and deliver what they say they'll deliver. Um, because make no mistake, you know, the, the, the dementia in football crisis belongs to all of football. Um, it's football's problem. It's a collective problem. Uh, and all the stakeholders, they all need to step up now. Um, 
you know, they need to be putting the health of the players first. They need to be looking after the players' families that have been affected with dementia and, and by reducing heading as, as much as we can do because CTE, you know, the type of dementia that killed my dad and, and killed Rod Taylor uh, and Nobby Styles is entirely preventable. Um, so yes, there's there's a new department um, and we've seen the DCMS inquiry, but that certainly doesn't mean pressure is off, far from it. Um, and everything that we, we do need, we need to make sure that it's sustainable and we've got the funds to do it, you know, from a game awash with money, really. Great, thank you. Rachel, this might be a question for you and um, you spoke really passionately about, about your your dad's experience and your experience of, of looking after your dad. Um, what helpful hints would you give for, for caregivers? What, what advice would you give for other people that are in a current situation like you are? Oh, well, it's, it's, I, <laughs> what, what, what I know people should do is not necessarily what they're going to do because often it is literally like the rabbit in the headlights. Um, you know, my mum knew that she needed to take practical measures, which might have been getting a lasting power of attorney in place so that as dad lost his ability to consent, then then we as the uh, power, the, the ones with the attorney powers could take over. And, and she was she was practical on some things, but on other things, she absolutely dug her heels in. And like I said, I said earlier, mums are really, really good at filtering when it comes to actually telling the kids what exactly is going on. Um, and I, I would, I would say, and I know there's some, like I said, like I know there's some mums on here to, tonight. Um, be honest with your kids, you know, because th they know, they know it's difficult, and you need to be open. You need to have open conversations with your loved ones. You need to think practically. You need to think, you know, if dad gets any worse, is he going to be able to give consent for a power of attorney? And then if it moves on beyond that, then then it's into a different whole realm of legal um, difficulties in, in guardianship. Um, think about if if it gets to a point where dad's got to go in somewhere, start to start to go out and look at places, you know, visit during the lunch hour, just don't ring up, just go and visit. And it's difficult during COVID, but, you know, go and try and visit when they're not expecting you so you can go and see the home when they're not expecting you. Um, start to think about what happens if that individual has to stop driving. Um, I, I've dealt with numerous families in the last few weeks where driving licenses have been revoked and of course once once somebody gets the diagnosis of dementia you're supposed to inform the DVLA and your insurance company and you know and, and in hindsight my dad shouldn't have been driving when he was driving um and it and it fell on my brother to say to my dad you know dad time to hand the keys over and it's it, it was really upsetting for my brother and my dad but he wasn't safe so you've got to You've got to have sort of real, really on and real honest look at yourself. And, you know, do you want to get in the car with somebody who that's not safe to drive? Do you want to put your grandkids in the car with granddad who's not safe to drive? Um, things like, you know, um, what's available locally, befriender services. Um, is there an admiral nurse locally? I mean, an admiral nurse is a, is a specialist dementia trained nurse here in the UK and they are worth their weight in gold. They are. They're unbelievable. Um, so, you know, try, try and suss out what's available. We obviously deal with former professional footballers. So we have, we've got a couple of girls in our department, Louise and Emma at DISC, and they are highly trained in all things related to the support system in the UK for people with dementia. They run courses. So they run a five-week course, um, which will tell you how what the stages are of a dement of dementia you know the early mid and late stages and it helps it helps you plan it helps you is you can't stick your head in the sand on this um my mum tried to um and that's why we ended up with a crisis and, and care a breakdown because she was on her knees and and you know it's it it is difficult so please to to the to the the, the 
usually it's the the wife of the of the player please be honest with your kids please tell them when you're getting to the point where you really need them to the kids to step up or you need support don't don't keep them in the dark no thank you and, and, and some solid advice there so thank you rachel um, we've had a couple of questions, um, one around what the different stages of CTE, one on why some people progress more quickly than others um, in this disease. And, and I'd like to signpost you, we've got a, a webinar in a couple of weeks time, uh, I think actually it's next week on the 8th of February, um, where Dr. McKee will be talking us through the science of, of CTE. So please, please, please um, do sign up for that. You can, you can hear those, those answers direct from Dr. McKee, and there's no better expert to, to tell you than, than her. Um, I'm going to take one final question, um, and I, I'm going to pose it to John. Um, what, what do we think about changing the rules of football or any sport to protect players? Um, I think we often find other mechanisms that we, we can put in place, but what, what are your views on if we had to change the rules of football to protect the players? Yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting question. It's something that we haven't necessarily been thinking about so far, and I think I meant... Um, we made mention of that earlier is that a lot of the work that we've been doing recently has not necessarily been around changing the game on a Saturday afternoon, but but whether actually the majority of the um, the, the majority of the heading that's done anyway in football, you know, looks like it's done in training, um, especially after a, a two 0 loss at the weekend and the manager gets everybody in on the Monday and shells fifty balls in from the halfway line. So not something that we're proactively thinking about, but I think if we could if we could certainly look into it and. There are, there are changes in the rules uh, or the laws of the game all the time. And uh, people often think that initially the change is going to make the game worse. And then after a couple of years, nobody even notices and they forget that it was ever a change in the first place. So certainly wouldn't rule it out. It would just be very interesting to see what we could actually do. And outlawing heading, I don't think is anywhere we can, certain, can go in the professional game, but we can certainly look at it lower down in terms of youth levels as well and, and actually figure out, you know, when is, you know, is a brain ever ready to, to head the ball? Probably not, right? We all acknowledge that, um, but some of the high forces that it, that it um, is subjected to, but there's probably a lot we can do around younger players, especially, um, and protecting them. And we can really work on, I think, laws of the game and, and changing uh, things fundamentally in football at that level. So, I don't have a, a comprehensive answer for you now, but it, it isn't something we would we would rule out. Um, it would be very interesting to see where we went with it and how we could actually fit it into making sure that you know, football maintains its um, maintains its appeal to people that have been um, watching it for years and years. Sure, sure. Don. Yeah, it's, it's just there's just one thing I just, I just wanted to add before we, before we leave, and one thing that's the one thing that's literally drove me crazy over the years um, is. It's this thing of um, my dad's ruling of of bicarnal of industrial dying of an industrial disease, and as I said before, in other words, his job had killed him. Um, and I try and translate that to other jobs. And I used to be in the police force, and we used to wear covert uh, radios. And I was just thinking one day, if God forbid uh, somebody died of say a type of skin cancer and when they looked into it they realized that the skin cancer had been caused by the repeated wearing of this covert camera against a uh, covert radio against the skin i guarantee i guarantee that a verdict of an industrial disease within 24 hours the government home office whoever would have put an email out to every single operative that you do not wear that covert camera anymore until something, if they find something that they've built a cover over it or something, because a coroner has ruled that it has killed somebody. Now a coroner ruled that the heading of footballs, the repeated heading of footballs killed my dad and football does nothing. How is that possibly right? It wouldn't happen in any other job. It wouldn't. And I've said many times, you know, football is a much loved sport for millions of people. Millions and millions of people around the world, me included. But for my dad and for Rachel's dad, it was just his job. And they should be afforded the same protection from known risks as anybody else in any other job. But because it's sport, it's as if it doesn't matter. 
well, they're wrong because it does matter. No, thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, a really important point. And I think it's an important point that we'll, we'll finish on today. Um, so thank you again, Dawn, Rachel, John, for sharing your experiences, for answering some questions and, and being here tonight. Um, it's been a real privilege to, to spend the, the time with you. So thank you. You're welcome. If you or someone you love is currently struggling with symptoms of suspected CTE or concussion, we are here for you. Um, please reach out to the CLF helpline today at the URL you will see there, uh, on the screen or in the chat. Uh, the CLF helpline provides personalized help to those struggling with concussions, uh, post-concussion syndrome, or suspected CTE symptoms by providing treatment recommendations and peer support. It is important to know you are not alone and help is available. We appreciate you all tuning in tonight um, and hope you are leaving having learned something new. Um, the Concussion Legacy Foundation is able to put on events like this for free through your support. If you found this event helpful and want to pay it forward, donating $20 or £20 will help us continue to create more resources for this community. Uh, and Julia will add, add our donate link to the chat right now. Uh, we're wishing you and your family continued safety and health. Take care. And thank you.